when poverty meets change. Intergenerationally, you may have noticed me. I befall on populations unevenly. My approach is in the course of iniquity, attached to themes like disparity. Old social policies don't free people of me, and I excel during crisis economically. Trying to meet your basic needs? <laughs> you will definitely have to struggle with me, and I work in cycles most effectively. How do you do? <laughs> I am poverty. I devastate community in ways that those that have would find horrendous with fear, lack, and disease. I perpetrate affliction that's tremendous. Deficient access to housing and health care, violence, starvation, to name a few. And children that live in this situation are expected to do well in school. Yes, I affect children. <laughs> Age is not important to me. Newborns, cute ones, teenagers, oh, and yes, the elderly. <laughs> I diminish opportunity, making getting ahead real hard. I make it so parents are at home and they have to work three jobs. What do I look like, you ask? Well, I am part of families. I even manage to affect those, the ones with education and college degrees. For this particular family, the situation is rather unique because as hard as they are forced to work, they will never make ends meet. Income guidelines are set so low that most families are over the top meaning they won't qualify and will provide and will not be provided with the additional support that they need. So, this family makes $500 too much a year to qualify for aid. They are forced to decide between the choice of food or the oil bills getting paid. I can make it colder than cold in the winter. No heat would be the reason. But I will always compromise what a family needs. It doesn't matter the season. Yes, there are a few who have fled me, and to them I say, hey, great. But there's another 27 million in this nation that will never be able to escape. Unless, of course, there's change. Well, hello there. I am change. <laughs> I thought I heard my name. I am responsible for time's evolution as I don't ever stay the same. I give caterpillars the ability to fly on a journey that starts far from the sky. I am the rise from the fall. I influence the sum to be the all. I have been the voice of this nation that triumphs with an echoing sound, a movement that didn't start from the top, but with community and from the ground. I find it odd that change is challenged especially in 2009, it is imperative that we think progressive in this new day and time. The manifestation of poverty's resistance cannot combat leaders' resistance, persistence. To take on this ambitious task, we must remove the mask and face the facts and do the work that bridges the gaps. Respond to communities with susceptible, sustainable change that comes with putting policies and practices in the appropriate place, consider social factors and the economics of the present days, reduce disruptive methodologies that keeps families astray. <laughs> From those who experience extreme poverty to those just getting by, reform is most important, and the policymakers are our guide. So poverty, we have heard your voice, and sadly, we have seen you too. But the proclamation of change continues to reign to eradicate the likes of you.
Thank you, Carla Walker, poet and poet performers, Julia Tripp, Suni Ali, Diane Phillips, Keisha Miles, and Jesenia De Los Santos for centering us this morning as we join our hearts and minds to embark on a journey to reshape poverty policies for 21st century families and communities. I am pleased to, to be here as director of the Center for Social Policy in the McCormick Graduate School here at UMass Boston and to welcome you to this journey. The poem and our poetry performers so beautifully performed the poem created by Carla put a face on poverty and on the change we hope to create together. They gave a broad meaning to poverty. Yes, it is having too little to live on, but it is also being outside the social and political circles of power. Our poetry performers also bore witness to ways in which many of our current poverty policies are deeply flawed. Some receive, some do not. For example, in Massachusetts, before the economic crisis, 195,000 households were eligible for housing assistance and not receiving it. This is the pipeline to homelessness in our state, and the circumstance is worse in most other states. For the majority of low-wage worker households, workers' in wages may increase, but their over in overall incomes are at a standstill. Due to state and federal administrative hurdles and policies, these workers lose res important resources before they're able to actually earn enough to make ends meet. These policies fail to effectively incentivize work for all workers, full-time and part-time, including those who do the important work of caring for our family members. Many of our po poverty policies stigmatize and have an underlying deficit orientation. Men, women, and children pay a very heavy price for service receipt. In an effort to meet families and communities' needs, capacities and strengths are, at times, put on the back burner. Some men, women, and children, depending upon their race, gender, or immigration status, are affected by poverty and its consequences more than others. In Massachusetts, based on Michael Stone's work, over 60% of households of color, after paying for their housing, do not have enough to meet their other basic needs. This contrasts with 40% of Massachusetts white-headed households. Poverty and racial inequalities hurt all of us. They rob neighborhoods and whole communities of the talents and capacities of millions of men, women, and children in the U.S. and billions of others across the world whose energies are tied up with the struggle for survival. For example, a difference of 20 years in life expectancy chances for people with low incomes in a community in Baltimore is there's a difference of 20 years for people in, with low incomes as compared to people in an affluent neighborhood nearby, a bicycle right away. Our world cannot afford to lose the talent and human capital of any of our sisters and brothers. Many of us who are in this room today are intently engaged, as we must be, in working around and tweaking the flawed policies we have been handed. Relentless fights for adequate public resources and for making changes in administrative and legislative policies to turn around these policies are necessary battles and ones that many of us have been fighting for decades. However, the root causes of poverty and racial disparities are left fundamentally unchanged. Now is the time for fresh thinking. In light of our emerging understanding of how current social policies hinder the advancement of families and communities, the Center for Social Policy intends in its future work to advance interconnected social policies that can reduce economic, social, and political inequalities, including racial disparities, and enhance economic well-being of low-income families and their home communities. 
The policies we seek to formulate in advance have the following features. They recognize and build upon the inherent resiliency and capacities of families and communities reflected so beautifully in the family portraits that are rotating on the screen. These are families in poverty. This is the face of families in poverty, families with strengths. The policies we intend to advance would turn deficit formulations on their head. The policies we wish to advance are universal in design whenever possible. That is, they will apply to all residents regardless of race, gender, income, or immigration status. They will benefit all, families, workers, employers, neighborhoods, and communities. We believe that a more universalistic approach has the potential to eliminate stigma and social exclusion, leaving no one out in the cold. Margaret Blood this morning will use the Early Education for All campaign as an example of a universalistic framework, sharing her decades-long campaign strategies and the lessons she has learned. Our respondent moderator and panelists will bring their diverse perspectives to this set of ideas. Gita Pradhan as philanthropic leader, Yubi Jones as social justice entrepreneur, John Connors as business leader, and Enid Eckstein as late labor leader. The future policies we are working to create will remove policy hurdles that interfere with families' efforts to progress economically. After lunch, Randy Albelda will offer ideas in an alternative framework for policies that incentivize paid work, as well as the unpaid work of caring for our families. The future policies we intend to advance break intergenerational cycles of poverty, racial disparities, and income inequalities, and lead to an equitable distribution of public resources. Also after lunch, Chuck Collins and Michael Stone will offer some fresh and bold ideas along these lines. The Center for Social Policy is on this journey for the long haul, bringing solid evidence with those living the struggle sent and front to policy campaigns that are moving in the directions I just laid out for you. Creating partnerships for maximum impact. Today is the beginning. We are not the first to realize the opportunities that this economic crisis, as harsh as its consequences are, offer us to rethinking how we fix poverty in our state, nation, and world. And we know that you are here today because you see this opportunity as well. With you, we intend to draw out and document innovations happening on the ground in so many communities. We want to link those innovations to local, state, and, and federal policy. And there is a long history of innovation in our state. Community health centers, City Year, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, our landmark health care reform. The room is full of innovators, connecting our collective new understandings of what works and what doesn't work is a foundation for the change we want to see in the world. In Carla's words, a movement that didn't start from the top, but with community and from the ground. The plan for the day is to, has many different parts, and each part was intentional. First, there's an artistic component, component, and you see these family portraits as an example of that. These are portraits made available to us from the Fourth World Movement. It's an international movement to eradicate poverty. The Fourth World Movement has also provided us with these art panels. And please do take the time during the day to, when you see a tab on the art panel, pull it up. You will see what children say about what life chances ought to be. This is art created by children. The poem and poetry performance is a dimension of the artistic component today that we intended to engage your hearts and, and souls and spirits. At the end of the day, and we're saving some of the best to the last to hold you here, there will be a video of teens talking about their hopes and dreams, 
Some of those teens are with, here, with, with us right now. I'll recognize them in a minute. And this video was created through the work of Julia Mejia, Creative Mill um, Inc., and Social Focus Media. And um, there, I think, I think you will see at the end of the day how special this work is. The teens had a role in creating this video for you. We made an intentional decision to mix up the room. We don't want to be talking to ourselves anymore. Change will not happen that way. So you will see in many different ways throughout the day that we are structuring the processes so that there will be diverse perspectives and diverse backgrounds brought to each of the discussions. We are intentionally structuring the day so that every single voice has space to be heard. There are intentional facilitation processes that will be happening in the dialogue sessions, which along with the presentations will be reflected in proceedings that come out of the day and will provide direction for the center's work in the next 12 months as we facilitate strategic quarterly dialogues. Next year's event, this is going to become an annual event and also our analytical work. We hope today through this process to generate collective knowledge that by drawing from the unique perspectives and insights that each person brings to the table. Here is my hope for you and for all of us today, that we bring fresh eyes to all of these discussions. Along with drawing upon the well of your experience Consider finding ways to see and listen freshly. Anthropologists or ethnographers, um, we talk about it this way. Pretend you're a Martian who doesn't know anything about how things work here, and you have just been dropped into this campus center, and you hear how things work, and you have ideas immediately about how things could be. That may be a way to help yourself think freshly throughout the day. My second hope is that you find a way to have this day be a sabbatical for yourself. You are, after all, in a university. People in universities take sabbaticals. I invite you to participate and experience in this day to the extent possible with your cell phones and iPhones and Blackberries on the back burner. And if you are able to cancel your afternoon and stay for the whole day, you deserve a few hours to step away from your immediate demands to think, to share ideas, and to deeply listen. And now, to end my remarks, I'm, I'm going to just give you an expression of gratitude for the tremendous um, contributions that have been made by so many people to today and also to the, our whole effort. In the development and planning, the Fireman Foundation, UMass Boston, and the McCormick Graduate School facilitated for the last 18 months are planning this work. The founding investors and funders of our current housing-related work are the Boston Foundation, Hyams Foundation, and Sociological Initiatives Fund. Our steering committee, Sister Margaret Leonard, Nancy Schwoyer, John Connors, Terry Saunders Lane, Mary Claire Higgins, Ramon Borges, Jesenia de los Santos, Keisha Miles, Murray Frank, Elaine Werby, Arthur McEwen, Julia Mejia, Randy Albelda, and Michael Stone, with planning assistance from Judith Curland and from Gita Pradhan. Our co sponsors, who are all listed in your uh, packets and whose materials are alongside the wall there please go take a look at those. We are so grateful for the co-sponsors who are not only um, putting, having their name on the program list, but who have f contributed ideas and insights and are taking, many of whom are taking roles as facilitators and table recorders today. The whole poetry team and the en entire um, teen video uh, crew that created the video. I will thank them uh, at the end of the day and have them stand up. I'd like to thank all the facilitators and the recorders who um, are going to be sprinkled at all of the dialogue tables in the morning and in the afternoon. 
And finally, there is a whole bevy, 25 people connected to the Center for Social Policy who have had a very important role in the nuts and bolts for today. And they've been led by Sheila D'Alessandro, who's probably not here in this room right now. But for all of those people I've just um, named, would you please give a great round of applause and gratitude to all of them. And now I am really pleased to invite, to launch us this morning, the Dean of the McCormick Graduate School, Steve Crosby. I think Donna already launched us. Um, I would like to um, thank Donna um, for putting this together. Look at this room full of people to talk about restructuring poverty policy. Um, that's not usually where the big crowds go. Uh, but Donna has been the incredibly thoughtful, incredibly tenacious, incredibly idealistic, um, and incredibly creative driver of this process. There's been a lot of support, as she said, but I'd like to uh, thank Donna and give her a round of applause. All right. That was good. You got the idea. My first responsibility this morning, uh, I guess my second responsibility, is to welcome you all to UMass Boston. As you're beginning to see, if you don't already know, this is an extraordinary campus and a campus of dynamism and diversity uh, in its student body and in the faculty and in the staff. Dr. Keith Motley, our chancellor, whom I'm sure many of you know, is not able to be with us, but I wanted to give you a sense of what he sees as the mission of UMass Boston because it relates to what we're doing here today. In his inaugural address to the campus, Keith talked about, and this is a quote, the impact that we at the University of Massachusetts can and must have on future generations, the great issues facing our community, issues on which we must help lead the battle, are issues shared with other communities, other peoples in the Commonwealth, the nation, and the world. Many of these challenges center around disparities, be they in education or enlightenment, in healthcare, in income, in due regard for the elderly or children, or in environmental quality. Donna, your work and that of the Center for Social Policy is very much at the core of the mission of UMass Boston as our chancellor articulates it. I'd also like to welcome you to the McCormick Graduate School, which the center is a part of. Our namesake, John W. McCormick, who served as speaker of the United States House of Representatives, was an Irish politician from South Boston just across the bay. In his day and in the context of his times, he was very much a progressive legislator. As a member of the House Committee on Ways and Means, as majority leader, and then as speaker, John McCormick was one of the enablers of the great complex of laws that have until now tried to serve to fight poverty and equalize opportunity for the people of this country. He was a leader in the New Deal, passing the Social Security Act, unemployment insurance, progressive tax reform, the minimum wage, public housing subsidies, and much more. Thirty years later, Speaker McCormick was a prime mover behind Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, including Medicare, the Education Act of 1965, the 1964 Housing Act, and of course the Omnibus, e Omnibus Economic Opportunity Act, which defined the war on poverty. This is the body of laws that have been tuned and scrambled and tortured into the policies and programs, many of them now at least counterproductive, at least meaning if they weren't to begin with, that we live with today. It's entirely fitting that a new generation of progressives, under the leadership of the school bearing John McCormick's name, should try to rethink and rationalize these policies to suit the changed realities of today. So for UMass Boston and the McCormick Graduate School, thank you very much for coming and welcome. My next responsibility is to introduce to you our keynote speaker who needs no introduction as they say, Margaret Blood. Most of you know Margaret, or at least know of Margaret, and her position as the founder and president of Strategies for Children and of the extraordinary work that she's done in the, in the campaign for early education for all. You can see Margaret's formal bio uh, elsewhere, but what I think is most 
interesting about Margaret is that early in her career, she served as a community organizer in the inner city of Boston, and later on served in a, as a legislative aide in the State House, which we now think of as something of a cesspool. Um, but, Margaret, but Margaret has been a, an organizer inside and an organizer outside. And I think that background and that combination of skills is what gave her the tools to do the job that she's going to talk to you about now. My good friend, longtime friend, Margaret Budd. Good morning. It's really great to be here. Uh, Donna, thank you very much for inviting me to come tell the story of early education for all. I was in Guatemala when we first talked about this, which really gives the meaning of poverty a sort of whole different connotation in a country where half the children suffer from chronic malnutrition and really puts a lot of my work in perspective. Um, usually when I tell the story, and I really want to thank the center and the McCormick, uh, not the institute anymore, the graduate school, and the steering committee for creating this opportunity for all of us at this really critical point in the Commonwealth's history and in our, in our country and in the world's history. Uh, there couldn't be a more opportune time, so thank you for doing that. Usually when I talk to a group about public policy and politics, I begin with a definition of both. And for those of you who've heard me talk before, please forgive me uh, because you will have heard this, but just to lighten the, the, the mood for a moment. We think about public policy oftentimes as that dry, boring stuff that's taught here or taught across the river at the Kennedy School. Um, and the reality, what I've learned working in the public policy arena, is it's all about politics. In Spanish, it's much easier. In Spanish, the word for politics is politica. In Spanish, the word for policy is politica. In Spanish, they understand it's the same thing. But we tend to think of politics, and I borrow this from former Representative John McDonough and others before him, poly meaning many, and ticks are blood-sucking insects. And to Steve's reference to the State House, none of us want to be involved with blood-sucking insects. <laughs> but I'm old enough now to tell you that it's the only way to get it done. So with that as a beginning, <laughs> how do I get to my... Can somebody help me for how I get to the first slide here? Thank you, Randy. Oh, I don't... There we go. We girls can do this That's too. right, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I have 30 minutes to tell you about a decade's worth of work. And what I'd like to accomplish today are the following goals. I'd like you to understand why we've taken an approach as a statewide movement to fighting for universal access to high quality early education. I want to share with you briefly the history and goals of this statewide movement, Early Education for All. I want to tell you about the five strategies that we've developed and are pursuing on behalf of the state's young children and families. I want to share with you the progress to date here and nationally. I want to share with you some of the challenges that we've experienced that I think apply to all of our thinking, and no matter what field or what policy angle we're coming to, and uh, the lessons that we've learned thus far. So beginning with how the campaign was launched. Just over a decade ago, I was approached by the Carolyn and Sigmund Schott Foundation, which is now called the Schott Foundation for Public Education. They were very interested in building a movement around universal childcare and knew that I had been involved for many years in a movement for universal health care for children. And were interested specifically in the lessons that could be applied from a campaign for universal health care for children to a movement for universal child care. And I was intrigued by that because we historically have had thousands of children on our state waiting list for childcare subsidies. And usually that number for the last decade or more goes back and forth around 20,000. Sort of no matter what happens in the economy, we seem to have this constant number of children who are eligible for state subsidies and never receive them. And I've also thought that's been curious for years as an advocate for children, how that's possible in a state which also for more than a decade or two has had the third highest per capita income in the country. So to me, that's really a political question. Why is it and how is it that we know so many families are in need and we have great wealth and we don't address that need. I think that's a political problem. So I suggested to the Schott Foundation before they begin a campaign, that they do some research. 
Now there's research that experts like Randy Albeda and her colleagues can help us with to understand sort of the econometrics, the sort of what the cost is around meeting this need. But almost more important was to understand who cares about our state's young children, who cares about childcare. So with the support of a number of foundations, I'm thrilled, like the Boston Foundation and the Davis Foundation that's here and others, I put together a committee of smart people from different sectors, childcare, education, organized labor, faith, business, and we conducted two statewide voter polls, and we interviewed uh, 48 opinion leaders inside and outside of government. And we asked them all about childcare and what they knew and what they thought. And what we found out was that there was tremendous interest, no matter what sector I talked to people in or voters, in early education, tremendous interest in helping young children, and tremendous knowledge about the benefits of intervening early in children's lives. But as we tested messages that were all research-based around the benefits of high-quality education, we found out that voters in our state were very willing to support increased investments in early education if we talked about it being for the benefit of the child, not for the parent. Big distinction. Historically, we've talked about childcare for working families. What voters understand is childcare, high quality, what they really call education, is about benefiting the child. That's where there's the opportunity to engage them. Voters in our state, and I'll show you some data later nationally, believe we should be investing in programs for all children, that every child deserves access to high quality early education. And what sold voters in our state, one of the research-based messages around the importance of doing this, was understand the educational benefits that accrue to children when you invest early in their education. We've gone on through the years to do other voter polls around this issue. And indeed, you see that the majority, the vast majority of Massachusetts voters believe that all children should have access to high quality early education. And in fact, nearly three quarters of the voters in our state, this is Republicans and Democrats and independents, believe that we should publicly finance early education for all children. And these polls are a little bit old, but the most recent poll I had access to was a poll done, done during the presidential last fall. 72% of the voters across the United States believe that pre-kindergarten should be available for all children, including those in middle class families. This is really important, eye-opening information that created for us a really clear opportunity we identified to begin to mobilize around education and early learning for all children in the Commonwealth. But what is the reality today in the Commonwealth? Today in Massachusetts, only one in four children, preschool age, have access or are in a publicly financed early education program. Now what's interesting is the majority of our preschool age children, ages 2.9 to school entry age five, are already in some kind of formal early education and care program, 70%. But only one in four of all children actually have any kind of public subsidy, be it a subsidy to be in a childcare program or in a public preschool program or in a Head Start program in Massachusetts. If we look at the population of low-income children in Massachusetts, it's one in three low-income children of preschool age have access or, or, or benefit from a childcare subsidy, only one in three of those who are eligible. Uh, very interesting that Dr. Ed Ziegler, who many of us know is sort of one of the forefront leaders, pioneers in the field of early education, professor emeritus at Yale University and widely regarded as the father of Head Start, three years ago wrote a book about universal preschool. And I was curious why he made the shift from being a proponent of a targeted program for poor kids to writing a book that got widespread attention across the country calling for universal preschool. And this is what I found in an interview that he gave at Columbia University. After 41 years, Head Start still only serves about 50% of eligible kids. It never has and it never will serve all those who are eligible. That's because the poor carry very little weight with policymakers. We always feel we can get away with a little less for poor kids. What I learned from the history of Head Start is that to maintain a good program, you need a broad and influential constituency, which he tells us now at nearly age 80. He goes on to say the benefits of experience. The problems in school are not limited to poor kids. If you examine dropouts, test scores, whatever you want to look at, middle class kids aren't doing that well. And there are so many more middle class kids than there are poor kids. No one ever talks about this, but the gap between middle class kids and rich kids in our schools is as large as the gap between poor kids and middle class kids. Who knew that here? It's true that poor kids profit more from pre-K than middle class kids. 
but it's like schooling in general. Why would we say we should only have schools for poor children? And indeed, the National Institute for Early Education Research at Rutgers has charted, has graphed, the gap that we see in academic abilities of children entering kindergarten. And if you look at that gap, it's the low-income children at the bottom of the graph up to high-income children. You see that, in fact, that gap that Dr. Ziegler talks about is the same from poor kids to middle-income kids as it is from middle-income kids to high-income children. Additionally, there's more and more research now about the benefits of high-quality early education for children of all economic backgrounds. And one of the things that excites us about the work we do is thinking about income integration. And in fact, there are studies, there have been formative studies highly regarded of the benefits of income integration K through 12. And now we see more research about the benefits of having children in economically integrated settings in pre-K. And they do show, in fact, that low-income children benefit significantly when they are in mixed income early learning settings. So with that as a backdrop, in 2000, we launched the statewide Early Education for All campaign. And our goal is to ensure, as a statewide public policy and advocacy campaign, that all children have access to a high quality early education, beginning at birth, but first and foremost, starting with where we identified the strong political will, that is for three, four, and five-year-olds in Massachusetts. Now, we organized this campaign and our policy proposals in a way that in my career, I've never seen done before and probably won't ever be a part of again. Uh, we started by spending two and a half years in the field, listening. We did 100 interviews, some volunteers helped us. I had one part-time staff person and myself at the time. And we went out and talked one-on-one -on -one to key leaders in the field, in the public and private sectors, in every corner of the Commonwealth. We then held 32 community forums, from Boston to Pittsfield, from north to south, Lawrence, Lowell, Fall River, New Bedford, small towns, wherever two gathered, we usually showed up to hear from the field, be they public school or early educators, or be they family child care providers, in English and Spanish and Chinese and Vietnamese, what was working and what wasn't working in Massachusetts when it came to the education and care of young children. We also met with 60 organizations across the Commonwealth, be they business groups, organized labor, faith groups, along with professional early childhood groups, and we continue to look at research around the evolution of early education policy here and actually around the world. From this listening tour, we heard from over 4,000 people over the course of two and a half years before we ever put pencil to pen to paper to develop a piece of legislation to introduce into the state legislature. And we use that experience to develop a, guide, a set of guiding principles to inform policymaking in Massachusetts based on what we learned from the field. First, that we would begin with a universal program universally accessible with the needs to meet all children from birth on through school age, those that need after school care. That this program, this initiative would be voluntary both for children and families. School is not mandatory till the age of six in Massachusetts. We weren't looking at lowering the mandatory school age to three, but in fact making a voluntary opportunity available to families along with providers. Not saying that every provider of Head Start or Family Child Care, YMCA, public school would need to participate, but with the hope that eventually they will that this program would need to be very flexible to meet the diverse needs of families. Some families need full day, full year services for their children. Some need part day, part year. Some families are looking for programs that are more aligned with language needs. And we wanted to make sure that we build a system that truly does meet the needs of children and families in the Commonwealth. We have embraced the notion of a mixed delivery system. I already mentioned that 70% of preschool age children in the Commonwealth are already in a program. We have a very rich array of programs in this Commonwealth we want to build on the strengths of the existing infrastructure and not throw it out. No need to build an entirely new system when we have a broad, rich array of services already in place. Key when you're building a universal program in a mixed delivery system is to have a universal program standard. We want to make sure that children and families, along with taxpayers, understand that our young children are benefiting from a quality or a learning experience, be they at a program in Mission Hill or a program in Newton, wherever it is across the Commonwealth, a family child care home or a public school, that that experience be defined by a universal standard. What we learned along the way from the field, most importantly, beyond some of the critical governance problems that we had in the Commonwealth around who controls the resources and the programs, was the need to invest in the staff. The research is beyond compelling that the key ingredient in delivering quality to our young children is who delivers that quality the quality, the training, credentialing, and the compensation of that early educator, that provider. Little did I know when we started a campaign for children in 2000 
that we would be marrying UMass and the rest of the higher education world who have become critical partners in this endeavor. We want to build, as I said, on the existing program strengths, which are many, and we want to phase this in. We know that even if we could win the lottery overnight, the legislature say we have a billion dollars to invest in early education, that we really need to build a system that currently doesn't exist in Massachusetts, and it would need to be phased in over time. Those guiding principles led us with a coalition. We now have 50 members in this coalition and a subset of early childhood experts that represent the panoply of stakeholder groups in the Commonwealth to design legislation that would have four primary goals. One is the universal access to high quality pre-kindergarten delivered through that mixed system. Second is to ensure that all children have access to full day kindergarten in our public schools. The third is to ensure that we have a system of early learning and care for all children beginning at birth. And last, but certainly not least, equally as important, is that we build and develop a high quality system of professional development for those that care for and educate our young children across the Commonwealth. In order to achieve these goals, as we began to file our, prepared to file our first piece of legislation in 2003, we developed five political strategies. And these, the feedback we've gotten is these are strategies that can be used in a whole host of policy areas. They're almost like five golden rules, and they're not rocket science. First is to engage influential, unlikely allies. And one of the things I learned over and over again working in the state legislature, uh, particularly under one former speaker, Charlie Flaherty, is that powerless children need powerful friends. I had the opportunity in the mid-90s to conduct a national study to understand how policymakers in all 50 states understand children's issues. And one of the things they talked about was their perception of us child advocates. And they talked about all of us as child advocates being well-intentioned and not very effective. They talked about the need for us to not only compromise, but to find ways to engage influential leaders in our communities. They talked particularly about business leaders and about religious leaders having untapped clout that could help propel these agendas forward. Equally as important is to engage the experts in the field, families and early educators. Our legislation would only be successful if it was informed by those who were gonna implement it. And we've engaged those likely allies, the early educators and their trade associations and professional groups, the unions, et cetera, in two different ways. One is the formation of a policy-making group that meets monthly, has been meeting monthly, and the other is to develop a grassroots field that goes back to when we first began this campaign and heard from 4,000 people. Third, just as important, is using research, and research to inform your policy and your communications. We're very fortunate in the field of early education that there is a robust amount of research and literature, first in the education literature and the child development literature about the importance of high quality early education and now in the economic literature. And it's key to continue to go back to that, especially when you have a coalition where people, a lot of what gets discussed is based on anecdote and experience. And it's so helpful to be able to go back to that research about what the research says about teacher credentialing, about what children and families need. And last but not least, what I most resisted was creating a separate organization. As Gita well knows, there are already too many nonprofits in Massachusetts, I think over 37,000 in the greater Boston area. Uh, but inevitably, we were required to, to create an independent organization that doesn't compete with our other uh, partners. We don't take any state funding that's capable of performing these functions and keeping a broad-based coalition together and aligned. A little bit about these strategies. Here's a list of our 50-member coalition. In the bright blue, you see some of the unlikely allies, the business groups like Associated Industries and Mass Business Roundtable, the AFL-CIO, uh, very unusual coalition of leaders who've come together to help inform, shape, and propel this vision forward. This is our policy committee of the likely allies. One of the biggest challenges has been having such an unusual group from the Catholic Church to the teachers unions, Head Start, Family Child Care, YMCAs, academics, all working together towards the same vision and uh, working together to agree on that same set of priorities. We work very hard. We've got a phenomenal research and policy team, which is often augmented by fabulous interns from our area universities and colleges. Four things that we found really critical to do is to produce fact sheets, basic facts. How many young children are there in Boston? How many are in Lowell? How many are in Massachusetts? Who's caring for them? What are the salaries of early educators in Massachusetts? To create policy briefs. No policymaker I've ever met has enough time to read all of those reports that UMass and everyone else produces. So we make it our business our staff, our volunteers, to read those thick reports, consolidate them into one and two page summaries that are phenomenal for policymakers, 
we're miracles with the media and are great for both the field to use when they're talking in their local communities as well as with their legislators. Research briefs, which tend to be a little bit longer, and then we've had to commission research. You know, fortunately, we've had support from the philanthropic community where we've identified a data gap, critical one, around the early childhood field. We didn't know what was the credentialing of the early childhood field in Massachusetts. The research is telling us a BA degree with specialization in early childhood makes a difference in quality. But we didn't know how many preschool teachers in Massachusetts have a BA degree. And we're fortunate to raise sufficient funds to have Nancy Marshall and her colleagues at Wellesley Centers on Women conduct that research for us to determine that only about a third of the preschool teachers in Massachusetts have a BA degree. Uh, the legislature mandated that we, in the state budget, they didn't fund us, but that we develop a cost study. And again, we're very fortunate to partner with the Center for Labor Market Studies at Northeastern University to come up with a robust cost estimate on what it's going to require in terms of incremental investments to ensure universal access to high quality early education in Massachusetts. Those are some of the examples of the ways that we use research and data. Here's a sample of a fact sheet, a fast fact, this hand to a policymaker. Here's an example of one of the charts that we use that business leaders often say to us if they can only use one chart talking to their colleagues. This is the one they want to use. It was developed by the Rand Corporation. And this tracks on the upper graph, you'll see brain growth. I'm sure all of you know when a baby's born, the least developed organ is the brain. And by the time we're five years old, it's about 85% developed. But look at how we invest our public resources. We make the least investment, that's the blue line, when we have the chance to have the biggest impact. And think about that. Today in Massachusetts, 92% of all children, six and younger, are cared for by someone other than a family member. 92%. It's incumbent upon us, as former Speaker Finneran would say, incumbent upon us to make sure that that care that they receive is the best quality it can be. Look at that opportunity between that brain growth and where we could be investing to get the biggest impact. Another sample of a summary in brief, looking at the summary of all of the economic literature. Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis does a study that finds that when low-income children have at least two years of quality preschool, there's a 16% return investment to the taxpayer. That has gotten the attention of more than one business group in Massachusetts. 16% return investment, according to the Federal Reserve. Here are examples of some of the research I told you about that we've had to commission to help inform this policy work going forward. And we've had to raise public awareness. When we started this campaign, there was so little coverage about early education and care. And the little coverage we saw was usually a bad story somewhere in a local newspaper about something that went wrong in a child care center. We needed to reverse that. So we spent a significant amount of our time and resources doing what we call earned media, going out and doing editorial board meetings, working with local early educators to write letters to the editor of local newspapers. As a result of that work with our partner groups across the state, we've seen coverage now in 213 different newspapers reaching 85 million readers. There's only, what, how many people in the state? Seven million people in the state. Um, and we have earned 121 positive newspaper editorials, 53 in the Boston Globe alone. This has been critical for us, and you're gonna see the voter numbers, how few voters in Massachusetts or residents have young children, to really make this issue something that everybody can relate to. Here's an example of one of the Globe editorials. Here's an example of working with some of our unlikely allies. This is Rick Lord, from the president of the Associated Industries of Massachusetts, a piece that ran uh, recently in the Boston Business Journal. Here's our pediatricians, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the state chapter, key partners in this work. Here's a piece that was written in op-ed for the Boston Herald from Dr. Sean Palfrey, Boston Medical Center, the former president of the state chapter of the AAP. Here's an example of one of our early childhood leaders out in the western part of the state in Chicopee, letter to the editor that she wrote for her local newspaper about the importance of high quality early education. Targeting messages to families, in this case in English and Spanish, so that they understand the value and importance of high quality early education and the role that they can play also in helping to advocate on behalf of this policy proposal. Reaching public officials, we work with our local early educators to make sure that they get public officials out to their programs to see firsthand what a quality early education means work with them to get photographs of those public officials and get them into their local newspapers. And also we take the children up for Week of the Young Child. And here you see our Senate President, Terry Murray, with young children at the Week of the Young Child celebration that we had at the State House last year. Last but not least, the strategy I talked about building an independent organization, starting as a staff of one 
nine years ago. There's no blueprint for how you do it, but we figured our way between research and policy and field organizing and media communications, how to pull the pieces together to build an organization capable of managing this kind of enterprise. So what have we seen as progress to date from this multidimensional campaign? We saw, first of all, in the fiscal 2005 budget, the creation of the first Department of Early Education and Care in the United States. This was something that came directly from the field, from the 4,000 conversations we had across the Commonwealth. And that was concern among providers and parents and others that Massachusetts had a non-system of redundant services and funding for early education and care. And that first and foremost, we needed to create an integrated governance structure that would bring those dis disparate resources together around a shared vision, shared agenda, and shared oversight. For the first time, early education is part of the education agenda as it now forms one of three agencies that are part of the Education Secretariat that was created last summer. We've seen the creation in the budget in fiscal year 2007 of the pilot universal pre-kindergarten program. It began very modestly with just over $4 million. Today we have 6,600 children. We have a long ways to go, but there are 6,600 who are benefiting from funds that have gone to their programs to meet and maintain the high quality standard that we're advocating for. We've seen the creation of the Early Educator Scholarship Program. The study that we had Wellesley College do for us about how many teachers had BA degrees, and we found only a third did, we went to the legislature with that data. We said we need access for early educators to higher education. And four years ago, we were able to get a million dollars. Will you build it? If you build it, will they come? Well, that million dollars went in two months. Since then, we've been able to quadruple, thanks to the legislature, uh, the funding for this scholarship program so that today we've seen more than 1,900 early educators be awarded the scholarship to go back to get an AA or BA degree. Cumulatively, we've seen an increase of over 150 million new dollars in uh, targeted line items that we're working on as part of the system building. We've seen a near doubling of the percentage of children from 38% to 75% who are today in full-day kindergarten. And last summer, Governor Patrick signed into law legislation that was passed unanimously that began with a bill that we filed six years ago uh, to create the universal pre-K program in statute in Massachusetts. Progress we see across the country. This is not a crazy Massachusetts idea to have universal pre-K. In fact, we're behind many other states. Eight other states either have universal pre-K or moving that way. 30 states already invest in early education. We saw a 9% increase despite the challenging fiscal times in the last fiscal year. And we see record spending of over $5 billion in early education today. I think most exciting at the national level has been the election of President Obama. For the first time in a long time, we have somebody in the White House who understands the value of high quality early education. This is a staff that one of our, our, a slide that one of our staff just made, Titus Dosa Medias, which I think is wonderful because you see the politics here, what Obama ran on, what he committed in the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act um, in terms of early education and care spending, and then what he's proposed as part of his fiscal year 10 budget. Very exciting to have this kind of leadership at the federal level as well. And the challenges now, the challenges are many for us and for all of us. I'm only going to go through a few of the challenges because we could create a long list here, but the ones that I think are most salient and key to all of us as we gather here today. Obviously, the state budget, something that we're all so aware of. This charts on the black line, you see what's actually happened to the state budget as the dollars were appropriated. The pink line is what's, if you look at what's been adjusted for inflation. So we see now the slow decline of uh, dollars in our state budget. And this more graphically depicts what's happened to our revenue in the last year in Massachusetts. We've lost over $3 billion, which is just such a huge hit to our state budget. I think one of the biggest challenges that all of us face are, and you're hearing about this more and more in the media, fortunately, are the uncontrollable costs of health care. Massachusetts has the most expensive health care, health insurance in the United States, the most expensive, in fact, in the world. I was looking at this slide. This is our current fiscal year budget where we see 38% of the state budget goes to healthcare. I used a similar slide, a presentation in Springfield two years ago, it was 29% two years ago, which is over a 30% increase just in the last two years. This is what I find the most frightening for all of us to be thinking about is how we come to manage those healthcare costs. We are also an old state. You know, I, my hairdresser helps me, so I don't really fit into this so visibly, but. <laughs> We are gray. If you look at the demographics, what's happening here, the fastest growing segment of our population actually is over 85. But if you look at the population growth, over 65 will jump 
nearly 14 percent, from 14 percent to 18 percent by 2025. So nearly one in five residents are going to be over the age of 65 in this Commonwealth. And the natural constituency here in Massachusetts, less than 13 percent of our households have children under the age of seven. That is not, thank you, that's not, if you were going to run for office, that is not a strong base on which to build a statewide campaign. Interestingly, in all of our statewide voter polls, we see huge numbers of support among senior citizens for high quality early education. And going forward, we hope to engage more seniors in our efforts. The last challenge I'll mention, I'm running out of time, is that which gets measured gets done. There's an ongoing debate in the field of early education around what constitutes appropriate measurement for young children. Young children's learning is episodic. Uh, there's, I think, questions about what is it appropriate to really measure. And this is a key challenge that we have as a field. And I think that we have across the social policy domains to really be able to demonstrate that the investments that we want taxpayers to make in our programs truly do make measurable differences. This is one of the metrics, or probably the key metric, that we plan to be organizing around going forward. That's reading proficiency by grade three. It has long been said that the first seven years of life we're learning to read so that the rest of our life we can read to learn. Third grade proficiency, we started to measure it in Massachusetts in 2001, is a key predictor for future academic success. We're now charting what happens to kids in eighth grade and high school. If you look at this graph, you see that just over half of the children in Massachusetts are reading at proficiency in grade three, just over half. This graph, the pink line, shows what the proficiency is among all of our low-income children. That's children at 185% of poverty or lower. And then the graph is 67%, the light blue on the top, are our high-income children. So we have a long ways to go in ensuring that the investments that we're asking taxpayers to make in young children from birth on up through their preliminary primary school grades actually do result in some significant measurable differences. What have we learned so far? Powerless children need powerful friends and a broad-based constituency across sectors and across the Commonwealth. Likely allies must be engaged, those that have the expertise and the consumers in the policy formulation and in the political strategy. Research is key. Without it, we don't get very far. An independent organization can be a coalition that's capable of keeping the group together and focused. Change takes a long time, much longer than you think. When we began this campaign in 2000, the Commonwealth had excess revenues. We had all this strong political support. I thought, oh, we'll have this done in three to five years. Little could I predict that 10 years, nearly 10 years later, I'd be here telling you, we've only just begun. You gotta pick the right legislative champions. Too often than not, we will end up picking somebody who is a, you know, aligned with our cause and they care about it and they're passionate about it, but they may not be the right person in the House or the Senate to get that done. So really thinking strategically about how you pick that champion or champions that are in a position to get it done for you. Communication is key, different languages, different constituency groups. How you manage that communication is also part of your strategy. Being opportunistic, when we hear that there's going to be a discussion at the Kennedy Library about workforce development, we'll call the AFL-CIO, Bobby Haynes is going to speak and say, make sure you talk about the workforce needs of early educators. When we hear there's going to be a, a forum about education reform, we'll contact a panelist and make sure they talk about early education as a critical part of education reform. And certainly, last but not least, is to keep child-centered. The co-chairs of our campaign have been phenomenal. Our volunteer co-chairs, Paul O'Brien, former chairman of New England Telephone, and Mara Aspinall, uh, from the pharmaceutical, or, or the, uh, I'm sorry, she just moved from Genzyme to a new biotech company. And they always say that we candle everything we do against what's in the best interest of the child. And having that be your center guiding post has absolutely been essential and been our key to our longevity. Our next step is to really broaden the coalition, broaden the base around reading proficiency for all. We don't know the name of the campaign yet. We want to work hard to sustain the gains we've made expand the constituency on their behalf, and work towards this key metric that we think will benefit the Commonwealth for all the years to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Margaret, for your visionary leadership and for these tremendous lessons learned um, from your incredible campaign over such a uh, long period of time. I would now like to welcome up to the podium Gita Pradhan, Hubie Jones, John Connors, and Edith Eckstein. 
we are using what Margaret just shared as an example of a universalistic approach to policy and now thinking about how that universalistic approach, what we can learn from it as we, as we an, anticipate and work toward reshaping poverty policies. Gita Pradhan is the Director of Programs at the Boston Foundation. She will be the moderator. As many of you know, she has um, provided leadership at the Boston Foundation for a, a many, many years. Um, she's a woman with, who is a big thinker, and as Terry Saunders Lane told me, she's pretty persistent. When she gets a big idea, she really moves it forward. And I've seen her do that many, many times. Most recently with the um, nonprofit sector um, initiative that she facilitated over several years. We're so happy for Gita to be a, um, a colleague and champion of the work that we're undertaking um, today and in the future. Next to Gita is Yubi Jones. And on the website of the City Year, this is how Yubi is described. Social justice entrepreneur in residence. I really love that. <laughs> and I think probably there are many of us who, you know, want to take on that title. Yubi um, has been a friend of the center for many, many years. In fact, was working at the center before, right before I started in the early 90s. And as many of you know, started more than 30 organizations, nonprofits in the Boston area, uh, helped to create the Children's Chorus, um, created the City to City program. There are so many uh, accomplishments. UB is a force of nature, and we're very happy for you to be here, UB. Sitting next to UB is John Connors. Um, who is the CEO of Boathouse Group. By the way, where is Jamie Tuzinski? <laughs> um, uh, uh, John's team, including John, Jamie, and Paul, created the incredible um, uh, invitation and in all of the design templates that we're using today. And we have so enjoyed working with the team and have benefited greatly from John's uh, insights. In addition to John's work leading up Boathouse Group, he is on many, many boards, and he also has recently cre created the online Small Can Be Big, which links families with some extra to families who are on the edge of losing their homes. And it's a very creative, you must go on to the website, Small Can Be Big, you will see the power of this um, initiative. Next to John is Enid Eckstein, who is the Vice President at Large for 1199 SEIU and over decades has um, really been right in the middle of in ensuring that the workforce, particularly workforce uh, with low wages, have the kinds of benefits and supports that they need um, as workers. Gita will moderate the panel and has a set of questions that um, she will ask each panelist to, um, to address, and um, you're off and running. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. First of all, I want to thank uh, the UMass Center for Social Policy uh, for this really incredible opportunity to bring us all together at a very important time, a very opportune time to have a conversation about a very important issue, which I think for, for the last couple of, uh, I would say the last 10 years or so has been really put on the back burner, the issue of poverty, something that we confront and we ignore and we move on. We cannot afford to do that any longer. Uh, it's, it, I think it is both not just a social and a moral responsibility, but it also makes a lot of economic sense as uh, Margaret's uh, presentation just showed us. Um, you know, just on listening to Margaret's presentation and I actually heard uh, her present a few years ago at the Boston Foundation 
when the campaign was um, you know, up, just up and running and all of this progress that I hear today had not been made, and it made me think of a couple of things. Creating change of this kind needs both a mix of patience and impatience. And I can see the patience and the persistence that it has needed and the progress that uh, uh, you know, this uh, campaign has been able to make over the years. And impatience, because if you don't have the impatience, if you, if you let this continue, if you let this persist, it will persist. And so you have to have the impatience to create that change. And the mix of those two really um, has, I think, resulted in a fabulous benefit for all of our children, grand grandchildren, and the future generations. So thank you very much for all your fabulous work, Margaret. I don't know where she's gone. Oh, there she is. Thank you. Um, in, in listening to the strategies, you know, one of the things that came across to me, um, probably rose to the top for me, was the fact that the starting point of a lot of this work is the need to create these unlikely allies, the need to create, to set a new table, to have a shared vision, to create a reframing of issues, you know, someone, and I think this is a cliched thing that everyone has heard by now, that the description of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, that's what we've been doing for a long time. We keep talking to the same people, setting the same table, framing issues the same way, and we expect things to be different. Well, I think this, we have a real opportunity right now both with the kind of, uh, you know, spirit and approach with the new, um, you know, uh, presidential, uh, um, you know, at the presidential level and the new administration. But also because there has been such upheaval because of the economic crisis that a lot of our, you know, entrenched views about who is poor, about who gets affected has actually really been uh, shaken up. And there are many different people at many different levels who are seeing all kinds of stresses that no one had ever seen before, and uh, at least in our, most of our lifetimes. Um, so I think this is a real opportunity, and they have, uh, you know, to really think about this issue, to think afresh about this issue. And so, uh, you know, we are, I think, really fortunate to have that kind of a perspective on this panel. So my first question to the panel was that. Uh, you know, when we bring together people from different perspectives, first of all, we, you know, there are a lot of entrenched um, views, different ways of thinking, uh, and there is a tendency to not sort of connect uh, with, you know, you, the, the tendency is to connect with like-minded people. So if we are looking at connecting with, you know, first of all, you know, just going from a very, um, uh, selfish perspective uh, of any constituency, why should you care? You know, I, what, would, what do you think, Hubie, would be the um, value of bringing in other constituencies? You know, why can the social sector not solve this problem itself? Why does it need the business sector, for instance? Well, first of all, oh, my, uh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> you are there, I'm here. First of all, when I heard uh, Margaret's presentation, uh, I thought about uh, Alvin Shaw, who was a professor of social policy at Columbia University, who wrote a powerful article that turned into a book, really, over two decades ago, about the fact that we are being harmed by duplex public policy. Public policies that are directed toward the poor, and benefits for the poor, and then different public policies that are directed for the middle and upper classes. And as a result, we have this antagonism between the middle class and the poor, with the middle class feeling that benefits for the poor, they're not sharing, and that's not right. Uh, and as a result of that, we don't have this broad-based constituency so that we can have, with, have uh, universal policies that benefit everybody. And unless we understand that, which brings everybody in the, to the tent, uh, without universal public policies, we will not enact progressive pu public policies that everybody, benefit, everybody benefits from, and that can be sustained over a long period of time. That is the challenge for us. And those of us at the community level have to get it. We have to get that that is where it's at. Uh, 
the most effective social policies, policies in this country have been Social Security and the GI Bill of Rights. Okay? Thousands, millions of people, of elderly people, have been kept out of poverty because of Social Security. Poor veterans, through education, were catapulted into the middle class. It was a policy that everybody benefited from. Effective, the most effective policies, and they were universal. All of us have to understand that that is where it's at. If we don't go this universal policy way, we are just going to be fractured from one another. We're never going to come together, and we've got to be working together in a universal kind of way. That is the challenge. Now, we have an opportunity now. I think we have an opportunity now because there's insecurity everywhere from top to bottom. We, got a, we have a window of maybe, maybe three years, maybe four years. Probably Obama will be there for eight, eight years to get this thing right, to get this thing right. And those of us who have been struggling who have never had for a long time the center of the society, the federal government, on our side are in disequilibrium, some of us. We don't know how to deal with folks in power, uh, friends in power. We're going to have to figure that out collectively. We're going to have to figure that out. Uh, but we, this is an extraordinary opportunity. I never thought I'd live long enough to see it come back around this way and we better not blow it. So John, what, what, what do you think from the business perspective, you know, what's in it for business? You know, I mean, particularly you're looking at the issue of, um, you know, of poverty and from a, from a personal perspective, you know, what I know of you, I know you care, but give us a sense from the broad business perspective, what are some attitudes uh, about this issue? What are some um, benefits or flaws that people see which would come in the way of our moving forward on universal policy? Uh, I don't like to follow Hugh because I know one one thousandth of what he knows. So just with that caveat in place. Um, I think um, to, uh, there's two parts to my answer, I think, to that question. One uh, builds on Margaret's comment and her final quote there from the Kennedy School about uh, what, get me what gets measured gets done. Um, and I think that's sort of highly accurate and hard to argue with. But I think in the business community, uh, there's probably one additional part to that. And I think uh, it's sort of in the Yogi Berra category, but it's uh, what gets done gets done. Uh, and I think there's a really simple philosophy in the business community, which is all about execution. Um, and I think a lot of times when the business community, I think, looks at the policy community, I think there's a dynamic that there's, uh, there's a lot of sort of discussion and talk about outcomes, but there's not necessarily as much action in getting stuff done. Um, and I think the business community at a certain point, and, and trust me, I've experienced this sort of both in trying to sell it up the ladder and, and, and trying to push it down the ladder, but it's the business community respects either getting it done or not getting it done. And so I think that a big part of the opportunity in this room today is to connect um, how do we take the policy so that you all know so much about, but also just get them done. Um, and I think there's so much sort of spirit and attitude, and, and I think the web enables so much potential and to bring different parties together and to get stuff done. Um, that, that has to be leveraged in a resource-rich environment like Boston. Um, and so I think if we can, I think the business community will participate if we ask them to help us get things done that are very specific, that are very tangible, um, in addition to their money, because I know they're willing to participate as it relates to time and as it relates to resources and as it relates to money, um, but I think we just have to challenge them to help us get things done. In it from your perspective, what do you think? Well, <clears throat> thanks, Margaret, for your um, comments on universal um, childhood education. I'd like to speak about what I see as universality, which is from the perspective of working uh, men and women in the Commonwealth, which is the right universal right to a good job with good wages that is health care for all, secure retirement, and access to 
uh, rising up the career ladder because what we see in the Commonwealth is many workers stuck at dead-end jobs. And I want to change the paradigm a little here to uh, change it from uh, change um, through engagement to change through empowerment of the working men and women of the Commonwealth. And I think that really happens, and I was looking for the source of the quote that the best anti-poverty program is a union card. And whether I was trying to find out whether it was Johnson who said it or uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Jr. but that, that is really a mantra that is really needs to be heard and respected here. And let me just quick tell you why I think that is before we talk about how we organize with other people. Union members and through unions, working men and women have a recognized voice for change that gives them the power to advocate at the state house for programs for children, for changing um, access to services or any of those things that other people in this room really you know, take very seriously. Unionization also raises the boats of all in the community. In the 1950s, 33% of Americans were organized. Many workers had good pensions, health care, and one income job sustained families. We have members who work five jobs out of two, mar um, two people in a family, and they cannot sustain a living for themselves and their families. What a tragedy in today's world. Um, equitable distribution of income starts by people being empowered to deal with employers to say that working people need a fair share. And also, we're a great ally for purposes of expansion of services because uh, 1199, our union, was the first and foremost to be fighting for universal health care coverage in Massachusetts. Why? Because not only do our members deliver health care, but they cannot afford to purchase the health care that they deliver day in and day out. So when I think about what are the big policy challenges to giving universal access to unionization, which is really what is going to change things radically in this country, because that is the grassroots social movement, I saw that slide up there, and they had a couple that said, I felt politically empowered, and now I'm a force to reckon with. I wanted to see a slide up there that said, I'm a member of a union, and now I have a voice that gives rise to my political power to fight for more, so, you know, fight for social justice. <laughs> Sorry. But I just wanted to speak to two very quick issues on universality for union members. One is the Employee Free Choice Act. Men and women in this country do not have a free voice right now in their workplace to speak out, to have a union. Uh, our union has done some pioneering work, but this morning my husband is a union organizer, and he's organizing a company, I won't say which one, and there are 18 employees who sign union cards, and every one of those employees has been called in, harassed, retaliated against, and it's all legal under the National Labor Relations Board right now in this country. We have a travesty going on that's denying workers their right to free speech, free speech and their right to cho choose once they walk into a workplace. So the Employee Free Choice Act, I know Randy's going to speak about it later, but um, don't believe the lies you're being told. This is the greatest piece of empowerment for working men and women in this country and can change the balance of power in this country. But that's not enough. The other piece is that not all workers have the right to unions. In this commonwealth alone, there are childcare workers who do childcare at home. There's tens of thousands of them, no right to a union. Uh, home care workers, our unions just organized 23,000 home care workers, personal care attendants, paid for by the Commonwealth. They had no record of, no employer of record other than the one individual consumer. We built an alliance with the consumers, with families of, you know, of people with muscular dis, you know, of MS, cerebral palsy, people at home who wanted to stay at home, which is a cheaper alternative for the Commonwealth. We changed the law, and now 23,000 workers have a union. But more importantly, not only do they have a voice, they had a political voice to advocate. In their first contract, they just got a dollar and a half an hour increase, their first increase in six years. They're now fighting to expand health care coverage. That's really talking about taking men and women out of poverty and giving them some control over their lives and empowering them to make their own decisions. But also, we've been the best advocate that the disability community has seen in Massachusetts because we are a very big voice on Beacon Hill. So we've been talking about expansion of services. And you can't have good services without, without caregivers being paid fairly. So those are some ways that we're trying to change the paradigm and really talking about empower, empowering workers to be the best advocates for universal services and universal um, wages and the ability to rise out of power. So that little photograph up there, let's change it to say that with a union voice, 
I actually ha I'm a force to be reckoned with. So, so this is actually very interesting um, because it, it brings up for me exactly the, the question that I was sort of thinking, you know, which is um, what, what happens when you bring unlikely allies or often what may be opposing points of view to the table. And uh, we all know that there is always the tension between the unions and employers. Um, there is often tension between uh, community needs and uh, business needs. Uh, so what, from your perspectives, you know, is um, what is the implication of bringing something, these uh, two different points of view? I mean, the example that you gave right just now about, uh, you know, organizing, uh, uh, you know, uh, workers at a business versus the business point of view. What, 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 where do you see these tensions? Um, and how do you think these tensions can be resolved if we are looking at a collective strategy to bring about change in an area which, which requires, uh, you know, the coming together of uh, these points of view? Well, I think the challenge is that uh, how do you maintain your integrity and your position and yet express it in a way that other people can take it in is the challenge. I remember when I was running for Congress and when I started my campaign, I didn't know how to do it. I said the same thing to everybody, whether it was a room full of Irish Catholic women <laughs> about my, about my, uh, my position on uh, on, on, on choice, <laughs> or et cetera, et cetera. And people didn't hear me, okay? So my question, I think the challenge for us is, how do we communicate, how do we maintain our integrity, say what we have to say, be clear that we want other people to connect with us. You know, I just heard you on the, on, you know, on the union stuff. Uh, my father was a union leader. A. Philip Randolph was, was God in my house, mm -hmm. okay? So, uh, but I think the union and business and social service folks, how do we, uh, are, do we have to do some things differently? Do we have to do some things differently if we're gonna be able to connect with others? Uh, I mean, I'm de dealing now with some social folks in the social service community and some of their models for service delivery are outdated. They're not relevant to the 21st century, okay? And we've got to deal with this stuff, all right? So I think the challenge for us is, uh, is uh, how can we communicate so we can get connected to understand how we can come together? I think that's, I think that's the challenge. And the other thing is we've got to take enough time to listen to each other and bond with each other because if we don't know each other, we're not going to trust each other, period. Some of you know I took a group of 22 leaders to, to, to New York to look at the Harlem Children's Zone. Well, we spent three hours before we ever got to the Harlem Children's Zone introducing ourselves to each other deeply. Why do you do this work? What do you care about at this, at this stage of your life? Why are you on this trip? What do you want to learn? We took time that we would never take in Boston to get to know each other deeply. And I learned something about folks I've known a long time that I never knew before. If you can't bond, if you can't trust, I'm telling you folks, you're not going to get anything done. Um, I think I'm in a similar position. I think the, uh, I hadn't heard the number that Margaret, I didn't know the number until Margaret presented it earlier about 37,000 not-for-profits, but uh, I could feel that number, even though I didn't know that number. Um, the, uh, and to me, you know, if you figure this, 37,000 not-for-profits, um, that's 37,000 people that think they actually have a better way of doing it, just in Massachusetts. And then you take the policy people, so that's probably another, let's say it's 37,000, and then you take the politicians, uh, and then you take the business people, and by the time you're done, it's probably around 100,000 different points of view on, and everybody with a, you know, often wrong, never in doubt type of mindset 
Um, and I think that's is just, you know, I think uh, one of the things that, uh, that Obama has shown us is there's, in some cases, when things are so obviously broken, usually there's some fundamental things uh, that, that are really simple ways to solve problems, but nobody has actually wanted to face those things because it meant sort of knocking down barriers that nobody wanted to really deal with. It was easier to walk around those barriers. And I think if we're going to fix the poverty problem that Gita started out with, which I, you know, I have to believe is an addressable problem or I wouldn't be here, um, I think we're going to have to figure out what we really believe are some of the best practices. And all the things can't be the best practices, unfortunately. Some of them have to be, and we have to as a group, and I think this force, this, the people in this room today and as over the next few years can start to be the center of, is what works, what doesn't, what matters, what doesn't, uh, and start to talk with a singular voice as a, sing, as a city and as a state. And I think this institution can make a lot of, can be the force behind it because it's focused on this city and this state, um, and start to create a focus in, in order to connect those 37,000 or 100,000 different points of view into a single point of view and have, fo and have force. And I think that's the power of what uh, Donna has started. Well, now that I've given you my hard labor line, <laughs> uh, I could also talk about our reality as a union um, and also you know, how we work to build trust. And I think UB's comments are you know, well taken. Um, you know, as a union, we're always seen as you know, representing our members' interests. And I think interest is an important view because who are our members? There are people who live in communities, who send their kids to schools, struggling with the schools, struggling with childcare, struggling with a healthcare system that is sadly broken in our state and you know, up and you know, all throughout. And what we've learned over the years is that as we look at our employers, we have maybe different positions on issues. Like we have a different position about how you might want to spend your money as an employer but we also have common interests and common ground. Our common ground is that we are wanting to deliver the best health care that can be delivered with very scarce dollars. And so our union has partnered a lot with our employers around some very ground, groundbreaking things. We just signed an agreement with the Caritas system, um, you know, the Catholic health care system, to talk about how together we can work to build better health care and at the same time recognize the voice of employees to advocate for care. Because I can tell you, representing healthcare workers for over 20 some years, I don't want to date myself, no, uh, but just joking that the reality is, is that frontline workers have a lot of very clear ideas about how healthcare can be delivered. And our goal as a union is to empower our members to work with our employers to advocate for the best healthcare system, and in doing so, to respect both parts. And so, you know, trust is an interesting thing. Because, you know, when I say I'm from a union, most employers curl and want to crawl under the bed. Um, but we have employers who are also seeing the value added of working with our union. Because I just was in a nursing home yesterday where we had our state senator in there meeting with 20 nursing home workers talking about funding for a nursing home. And the state senator said, thank goodness the union is here to be able to advocate for funding for this employer. Because what we are showing in the Commonwealth that while we may have different positions, there are common interests and common ground that have allowed us to build some really interesting allies, many of whom had been enemies in the past, because what we're advocating for is, you know, healthcare workers who can live in our cities, who can work in our facilities, and who can basically do it on not having four jobs. Because when you got, like, all those jobs, you're not giving good care to your residents. You're not giving good care to your patients, because you're focused elsewhere. Uh, our goal is to have sustainable jobs, in our communities and to be able to have good services and to work with those who want to work with the union to be able to advocate for that. And clearly it is about building trust. Our union today is different than we were five years ago or ten years ago. It's an evolution, but I think that we've shown that we can be really good partners around advocating for services and expanding services, whether it's for um, immigrants, you know, whether undocumented or people who are here illegally and fighting for health care coverage which is a huge issue facing our commonwealth, or whether we're fighting for services for persons who would not have it in terms of home care services or any of those other pieces of services that we all advocate for. Thank you. 
So now that we've figured out that we can work together, that there are solutions, let's really talk about the white elephant in the room, which is the state budget. You know, um, every one of our, um, uh, you know, our desires to um, either expand policy or to do uh, create universal policy has a, a budget tagline to it. And we all saw in Margaret's slide the $3.5 billion uh, deficit that we are starting with. Uh, added to that is the fact that the state was already um, uh, had borrowed from the rainy day fund. So we, as from what I know, we are actually dealing with something that is a much bigger deficit than even that, and then we have to balance our budget. What, what it's going to mean is that programs are going to get cut, and we are in that environment, we are having a conversation about ideas that may actually increase costs. And uh, so I think to, to what it brings up is the idea of having to say, really look at reframing uh, the issue and rethinking and really thinking about these ideas and these uh, concepts of universal, universality, uh, of flexibility, of access in very different ways. And John, you said that um, you thought this was a solvable problem and that's why you were here. So I'm going to put you on the spot first to say, so what do you think? The, uh, the <laughs> um, thank you for having me today. <laughs> um, the, uh, I'll go back to something that, that I think we do better in business than you do in the, in the social arena, which is, uh, you know, we, when, a, when a product isn't working or a solution isn't succeeding, uh, we stop sort of pushing it uh, and we let it, we let it die. Uh, unfortunately, in this arena, uh, and I think the state budget is packed full of programs like that, uh, we like to keep everything going. Uh, and we don't like to sort of, you know, unfortunately, I can, if I want to try and sell something, I can talk about it. But if it doesn't sell, there's a, a capitalistic reality to the fact that it doesn't actually have an impact. Um, but I, and I think, now, the reverse of that is that good programs can get killed if we're not careful. But I think the, the dynamic is, if there is a voice and a power and a push and a singular voice and not 37,000 or 50,000 voices behind what actually we believe works and what we don't believe works, I think we can actually make that change and we can be uh, a market that actually sort of innovates uh, in terms of how social policies get implemented. But if we want to only create new ones, and not let any of the dogs kind of fall off the list, uh, then we're being irresponsible. So uh, that's maybe. Oh, but John, the auto industry is not a case example. <laughs> uh, uh, well, there, there, there are many, there are many, uh, there are many businesses that are continuing to do things that are clearly not going to uh, get them the profits they want to get, and they continue to do it. Uh, in some cases, like the auto industry, they understood that the federal government would ult ultimately come in and save them because the auto industry is a part of the, infra the military production infrastructure uh, of, this, of this country. Uh, and uh, they know they're never going to, they know they're, not, they're never going to go away. Uh, and uh, nobody talks about that aspect. But anyway, the problem is the, the dichotomy sometimes between the, the, the business sector and the service sector or the public sector, where all the competence is on the side of the business sector, really isn't, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't add up, really. You know but what I mean? You're missing the point. Am I missing the, the point? The, how, how many of the 37, how many of the programs being funded by the state budget are essentially programs that are no longer effective? And if we got rid of all those uh, kind of non-effective programs and actually preserved that money for effective programs, that's all I'm hoping for. Forget, I'm not worried about uh, national. I think, I, I feel like we have to solve it on a very small level first, but I think okay. there's, there are way too many programs that are just useless in town. I won't defend programs that should go away, but first of all, if we're, if we're gonna deal with the budget issues in this Commonwealth and the needs of people in this Commonwealth, let's get serious about taxation policy. Yep, thank you. Okay? Yeah. Now we've talked, we've talk, I mean, Margaret talked a lot about polling. 
every poll that I have seen of folks in this state, they always say they would like the, the state government to be responsive to the needs, the legitimate needs of people in the state. Okay, that, it's, always, it's very, very clear. Now, there's always been this, this issue about whether or not they would pay uh, the taxation uh, to make their wishes happen, okay? But that's because we haven't had leadership that's willing to help the people go to where they need to go regarding taxation, okay? If we're not gonna deal with a personal income tax that's, a, that's at the right level and that's not regressive, then we're gonna have these problems over and over again. If we're, gonna not, if we're not gonna deal with uh, a, a, you know, all, all the taxation, Tax, taxation determines social policy in this state, period. And if, we're not, if, if those of us who care about these services want them to be there and, should, and they should be there, we've got to be there around taxation policy. I'm, in the, I'm from the human services field, I'll tell you, we're basically missing in action. We're basically missing in action when these state policy taxation things are going down. We're basically missing an action, and until that happens, we're not going to solve this, this budget problem. Thanks. Thank you, UB. Um, you know, I, I was going to raise the T word, um, you know, taxes, because when we look at the state budget, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of programs have been cut to the bone and beyond the bone. Um, you know, we have situations where Boston Medical Center is going to lose millions and millions and millions of dollars, where, um, you know, our... Uh, healthcare facilities, yeah, healthcare is the budget buster, but the reality is, is our Commonwealth provides services to people, whether they're in nursing homes, whether they're in home care, or whether they access their services through, you know, Boston Medical Center. And, you know, we've also provided, you know, some move towards universal health care coverage. And those are good things that happen in the Commonwealth, but they don't happen without a price tag. And it's, you know, I, I think what we really need to see is courageous political leaders stepping up and there's a short-term solution right now, which is not one that we advocate, you know, in terms of a sales tax, but it's a short-term solution that will take us at least through this budget year. And, you know, we have a structural problem uh, in terms of our income tax policy, in terms of taxation. This year, corporations are getting a reduction in their taxes. We tried to change corporate loopholes and close them up, but Corporations this year and next year will have a tax break. We have an in, we have un, inequitable tax policy in Massachusetts. You know, years ago, a number of us worked on graduated income tax. We'd like to see it happen again. Um, but short term, we need political leaders who will step up and stop the bickering on Beacon Hill and do what's needed to do. And we need to support them. We have legislators who are afraid to take a vote because they're going to be taken out of office. Our union has pledged to support people who work to support tax policy that is, you know, an equitable policy. Um, but we all have to do that. Uh, and we all need to step up. Uh, we've spent a lot of time educating our members that a sales tax is not the right answer, but it may be the only answer temporarily. And we need to get our members and every other organization's advocacy engaged in the question of long-term solution. Because this year, it's more than a three billion. It's almost a $4 billion deficit right now in Massachusetts. And that's gonna be the same thing next year and the year after, because we're not gonna see an increase in revenues and we have structural problems. So, you know, who, who are we gonna cut? I don't wanna be sitting here and debating whether we should cut childcare or whether we should cut healthcare. That is not a debate I choose to engage in. We have to talk about a bigger pie and a pie that's a fairer pie and Massachusetts is not Taxachusetts anymore. That's, we haven't been Taxachusetts for many years. We fall in the middle, and we fall down in the bottom in many services. So our Commonwealth is very frayed, our safety net is really undermined, and I think we're all dealing in different places with a real crisis on our hands, and we need to change the debate around how we fund our services. You know, this is, this is I think, exact, there was, one heard a little touch of tension in this conversation, and I think this is exactly the tension that we actually need to deal with. Uh, you know, because I, because on the one hand we have, you know, uh, social policy and social service advocates, um, you know, asking for or demanding resources, uh, uh, you know, for programs that 
they rightfully see needed in the community. And on the other hand, we have uh, you know, uh, many people in the business community who think, and actually uh, this is something that we've, I've heard consistently over the years of doing work on the nonprofit sector, is that there's a lot of waste in both the government and in the nonprofit sector. Some of these issues are dealt with through conversations and through trust building. Um, some of these uh, are, uh, you know, dealt with, uh, you know, through making hard and tough choices. Um, but, uh, you know, the issue, and maybe it is the issue of universality that actually helps us get through it, and I think Michael Stone actually gives a very good example of the, uh, you know, um, on the one hand, in the housing field, we gave out Section 8 certificates, which are considered, um, uh, and, uh, you know, like an entitlement program or, um, you know, something to help the poor, and on the other hand, you know, we give tax deductions to homeowners. Uh, one is seen as, as a subsidy, the other one is not seen as, as a subsidy, it's a reward. So I think once we deal with these tensions and we can bring, out, bring them out in the fore and look at policies that are more universal, I think we will make a, a, you know, a big step forward in dealing with things in a way, in a, in a, with an approach of equity and uh, uh, you know, with the right kind of social compact, uh, what does it mean? What are we asking? What are we giving? Who's getting what? Um, we're actually coming to the close of our time, so I would like uh, for each of our panelists to give us a closing thought before we wrap up. The thing that we have going for us, in my judgment, and the thing that keeps me getting up every day and going at this, is that I think most people in this country have at some level of their being a great deal of disquiet about the gross inequities that, are, that exist here. And it doesn't take much scratching to get that released. We know that we can never be a, a whole country or a whole community with these inequities. Business people know it, labor people know it, young people know it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the millennial generation knows it. And these are the young people, these are the folks who are going to drive politics in this country going forward. No questions asked. At least for the next 30 years. They get it. That's why we have who we have in the White House right now. For, okay, so there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of uh, unhappiness about these gross inequities everywhere. And it's up to us to find ways, to find ways to give people handles to move to another place. And I believe they will move. I've seen people move. I've seen business people move. I've seen all kinds of people move, okay? And all of us are gonna have to move to a different place if we are gonna have a different kind of collectivity here uh, in this city, in this country, and basically uh, in this world. I think that's what we have going for us. Uh, if we didn't have it, uh, we would be in deep, deep trouble. Thank you. Um, I guess my piece is related to uh, how innovation happens. And I think it really, my experience is it typically starts really small, um, and I think the challenge in this part of the sort of, in this game that we're talking about is we're talking about such broad, massive, sweeping change in terms of problems like poverty and, and uh, that I think, but if we can find sort of uh, leadership as a combined group, and again, that's the point of this, what, what Don and team are kicking off, if we combine, can find leadership and one voice across the spectrum. Um, I think we can, and actually not try and change it on broad sweeping scales, but just put small things in place, but small things that actually really solve the problem. I think we can actually make the change, because I think the problems are relatively obvious, and I think we all know them, but I think actually making the change is the part that's so difficult, and getting one voice and getting aligned to make that change, if we can do that just on a, a New Bedford level or a Boston level and, and then start to spread it, I think uh, I just I believe in that ability to make change.
Um, we all know these are very challenging times. And, you know, I think just like the presidential election showed, these are also times of incredible change in our country and times of opportunity for something different. Um, and, you know, I think the challenge is that, you know, many people voted for hope and for change. And how do we capture that into some organizational form that is really capable of making change? And that, I think, is a real challenge because it's not enough to vote for change. It's not enough to go online. I have a 19-year-old daughter. She's, you know, right there online doing all those things. But, you know, in terms of really being able to organize for change, it takes grassroots organization and it takes people uh, striving to change their lives and being empowered in the process. Unionization is one way, and I think that the unions in this city have gone through a lot of changes, and there's some very exciting things going on in the labor movement in terms of speaking up for low-wage workers, whether it's you know our sister local empowering janitors or us with healthcare or other organizing. And I think one of our challenges as labor is to look for who we partner with, because we can't make change alone but we bring a lot to the table. We bring resources, we bring disciplined organization. We tell our members to get out there and do something. We can put a thousand people on Beacon Hill. Not a lot of organizations can, but we know we can't do it alone. And we know that uh, you know, labor is out there in challenging times um, you know, because there's a lot of opposition. But I would ask each of you, as you think about sort of your partners and campaigns you go on, to kind of think out of the box and say, hey, wait a minute. Are there other partners that we could bring to the table? Because um, I think that's part of you know, the excitement. I grew up in the 60s, and to me, what was really exciting was that people came together, and there, many movements had different allies. And I think that as we look at going into the, the first tens of our decade, or whatever that next decade will be, that in our community, there's all sorts of challenges for new alliances, new partnerships, and new abilities to change the paradigm to really empower people to take control. So we've talked about a lot of things. Uh, I think um, um, probably the most uh, important thing um, uh, that all of you have said is about keeping our eye on the ball, about building relationships and trust and maintaining the level of integrity and uh, equity that it's going to take to really solve these problems. Um, I want to sort of wrap up by um, uh, sort of drawing a, again upon the wisdom of um, uh, the work that Margaret's group has done, because I think uh, in that there were a lot of, a lot of what we talked about actually played out in real terms, and it gave us a real example of, uh, of success. Uh, so I just want to sort of pick up on a few things. The, uh, you, Margaret talked about the importance of universal and flexible uh, strategies and policies that meet the needs of everyone in the community, things that make it all equal, and where everyone can see a little bit of themselves in, uh, in that policy and the benefit that accrues to them, whether it's from business, uh, uh, you know, seeing the value of uh, investment in a child as a, as a future workforce, or whether it's a parent seeing the benefit of uh, what their child will be able to become when they grow up. Um, the importance of, um, of, uh, of unlikely allies and powerful allies on issues uh, like um, hunger, poverty, housing, you know, the kinds of social uh, issues that we are talking about. And at the same time, the need for strong grassroots leadership that Enid spoke about, uh, uh, and the relationship with legislators, remembering that we are trying to create policy change, and policy change is actually made by policy makers in the end, and so making sure that we are keeping them educated, informed, and on top of things, and accountable. Um, the importance of reframing issues, you know, going from a child care to a ch uh, early education kind of issue, and setting a new table where a shared agenda could be developed. Um, uh, the importance of, of the ongoing visibility of the campaign. I mean, you saw the uh, relentless um, pursuit of making sure that this was there in every local newspaper, you know, um, um, you know, statewide uh, distribution of newspapers, but also in many different ways accessible to people in the communities, to people who work on these issues day to day. 
and uh, the importance of backing all the messages with research. Um, so I think we've, we've learned uh, a lot today, and um, I want to um, give another round of thanks to both Margaret and uh, to our fabulous panel. And most of all, thank you to all of you who are going to go and do all of this work. So. And thank you, Gita, for a wonderful job of moderating this panel. Thank you, Enid, John, and Hubie. OK, now you are going to, A, be able to take a break, and B, move into dialogue sessions where every voice will be heard. We have intentionally um, created table groupings in each of the breakout rooms. Many of you who registered ahead of time have name tags that have a room number and a table number. We intentionally mixed up the tables so that there is a very a diverse perspectives and diverse backgrounds represented at each table. Each table has a facilitator and a recorder. And the facilitation processes and plan is such that we are going to invite you, each of you, to step up and speak your truth and step back and deeply listen. Through this process, we will generate collective knowledge that brings the best from what each of you brings to the table. And we trust that that uh, interchange, that connection, will be very fruitful and will uh, help us as we move forward. Your team in the dialogue session this morning is going to be your same team in the afternoon dialogue session. So there's continuity in your conversation. Some of you who walked in today and were not able to pre-register don't have name tags with room numbers or table numbers. You will need to go to the registration table and, be, and there will be a, 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 an assignment for you. Also, we have refreshments in each of the breakout rooms. So, proceed. <laughs>